But I'm really glad to uh, welcome Catherine McAlpine. And she took over at the beginning of this year as director of the Brunel Museum, as you see on your screen. Brunel Museum is in Rotherhithe. It is right where Mark and then Eisenbard Kingdom Brunel dug the Thames Tunnel, uh, an amazing bit of London history, London industrial history. If you go on the London Overground from New Cross or New Cross Gate northwards to the other side of the river, you will travel through it uh, quite unspectacularly, sadly. I've walked through it twice um, on various open days when they were refurbishing it. Um, but Catherine, thank you very much for joining us. Can you give us a bit of history? Because you're a museum person, as you can see from your uh, Twitter handle on the screen there. So Catherine, let me hand over to you. And please, can you tell us who you are and talk about the, and move into the Brunel Museum? Of course, yeah. Um, so thank you, thank you so much uh, for having me. I hadn't realised that I was I was uh, kicking off this season. Um, so thank you. That's a that's a real privilege. Um, so yes, my name's Catherine, and I am uh, in in January. I joined the Brunel Museum as director, uh, and I always have to caveat at the beginning of these talks by saying I am not a Brunel scholar. Um, that is not my sort of area of expertise. Uh, I am a museum bod, uh, sort of learning and engagement person. So as I was explaining to Alan, uh, while we were sort of waiting for people to come in, um, my job is to go and talk to uh, interesting, clever historians and curators and listen to them uh, and then sort of uh, find ways of, of telling those stories uh, more, more broadly. Uh, I've done that at, at a range of different museums. So uh, I've worked at the National Maritime Museum, which I'm sure the Greenwich Industrial Heritage Society knows very well. Um, and uh, I've also worked at uh, the Imperial War Museum in a couple of different roles uh, at a couple of their, their sites. So that's my sort of background. And then um, at the beginning of this year, I moved to the Brunel Museum, which uh, coming from some national, nationally sized museums uh, is a bit of a shock to the system. Uh, because being the director, you are also the curator, you are also the marketing person, you are also the learning person. Uh, but luckily, I am not the finance person uh, who uh, is the fantastic Sarah who has snuck into this talk um, this evening. So if there's anything that I can't answer, uh, Sarah's knowledge of the Thames Tunnel story is much, much deeper than mine. Um, but I will I will do my best uh, to share with you. So. As Alan said, and now are we going to have an issue with technology? No, we're not. Uh, as Alan said, um, our museum, the Brunel Museum, is on the site of the Thames Tunnel. And here it is on a, clearly from a much uh, brighter day than we've had uh, today. Uh, but you can see um, our tunnel shaft, uh, which was the first building on the site with our beautiful roof garden, which has been on there for the past sort of 10 years. And then the engine house, uh, which dates from a little bit later, from about 1843, 1843 sorry, with its uh, lovely chimney. Uh, and yes, we're just, um, just by Rotherhithe Station. So do please uh, come visit us when we're open on the weekends. Uh, but I'm going to tell you a little bit about sort of why, why we're there and what was the kind of reason for needing a Thames Tunnel. Um, so... You may have been, in fact, reading about a, a more recent Thames Tunnel. Uh, we don't need to get into the politics of it, but if you've been thinking, kind of, in, if you're in Greenwich, I imagine you are at least aware of the Silver Town Tunnel, which is proposed uh, to um, uh, reduce traffic levels, which is precisely uh, what was being proposed in 1825. Uh, so this is uh, London Bridge. This is an example of. Uh, of image of London Bridge from uh, sort of the early 19th century. And you can see it's massively congested. Um, it is sort of full of traffic um, going in both directions. It's incredibly busy. Um, it was also the furthest east crossing that you could have between North and South London at this time. And London desperately needed, uh, needed a, a more easterly crossing. Uh, so they said at the time that um, the Thames was a forest of masts. You, you might have heard that phrase before. Um, so it was ships coming into London from across the world, coming into the port of London to, to deliver their goods. They said it was so busy with ships that you could walk from one side of the river to the other just by stepping across the decks of ships. 
which is all well and good, but that's not an actual way of getting across the river. Um, so you'd have these, um, these ships coming in and because it was difficult um, to get things across, um, across to London Bridge because of all the congestion, uh, you'd end up with lots of these goods sort of staying on board the ships in the port of London, making them very vulnerable to uh, theft uh, and, and criminal damage and, and things like that. So something, something needed uh, to be done. Um, so enter to this uh, Mark Brunel. Um, so he is arguably a lot less well known than his uh, son Isambard, who we will come to in a little bit. Uh, but Mark's story is actually, I would say, a lot more interesting. Um, so he was born in France. He was uh, sort of um, aristocratic um, in his sort of upbringing and his, his birth, but he had a real kind of um, technical aptitude. He, um, uh, his, his father had intended him for the church, but quite early on worked out that that wasn't, that wasn't going to work out for them uh, and, and sent him to um, a sort of technical apprenticeship. Uh, he at some point met uh, a woman called Sophia Kingdom, uh, an English woman who, uh, for some reason, her brother had thought that it would be a good idea to send his sister to France while it was in the midst of a revolution. Uh, not actually the best idea. Uh, but Sophia and Mark uh, met and apparently sort of fell in love, fell in love at first sight. But due to the um, uh, minor inconvenience of the French Revolution, uh, and the fact that Mark was not particularly good at keeping his opinions to himself, uh, he was forced to sort of uh, flee uh, France, seek refuge in America. Poor Sophia um, ended up actually in a convent, um, sort of imprisoned in a convent uh, for some, some years before uh, being, being released. Uh, and the two then met up, um, met up again in England uh, and were married. They then moved uh, to Portsmouth. They spent some time uh, in Portsmouth where Mark Brunel did a lot of work with the Royal Navy. Uh, and that's relevant to our story because that's where he saw firsthand the impact of the ship's worm, um, which is a, uh, an interesting creature, uh, which bores holes into the timbers of ships. Uh, and in doing so, uh, it sort of ingests and then secretes the um, sawdust that it's created and uses that to make a sort of protective casing while it's kind of making its um its tunnel. so uh that will become uh relevant a little bit later on so uh there's an idea to build a tunnel under the thames in order to deal with this uh issue of congestion um why can't it be a bridge um because if we go back to all of our masts the technology wasn't available at this time to allow um, to create a bridge that was tall enough to allow masts through. Um, I'm sure those who are much quicker are starting to think about what that bridge might become later. Um, but if you're going to build a tunnel under a river, the first thing you need is to get access underneath the river. And that's where this um, this structure comes in. And actually, I'll nip back a little bit. This is our, um, the tunnel shaft, which you can still see today, um, which dates from 1825. So the structure is two very large um, iron hoops, one at the top, one at the bottom, with an inner brick wall and an outer brick wall. And work on the, um, uh, so this was, this was built on, and on the 25th of March, 1825, uh, it began to be sunk into um, into the soft earth at Rotherhithe. Um, so why I build this structure? Well, you could dig a great big hole, um, but that's very resource intensive. It takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of energy. It can be quite expensive. Whereas what Mark did was he used the soft earth of this particular bit of the riverbed to his advantage and let gravity do the rest of the work. So um, this is an image from the Thames Tunnel Archive, and I don't know if you can see, it's meant to be sort of moving. Um, so it was constructed, uh, the tunnel shaft, uh, and then it sort of sank into the ground at a rate of uh, a couple of inches every day um, until the 3rd of June, 1825, a couple of months later, uh, when it would sink no further. It had about two feet left to go and it wouldn't budge. It would not move. So Mark, um, in, his, in his wisdom think, I know it's just not quite heavy enough. We just need to give it a little bit more weight and orders 8,000 more bricks to be added. 
it does nothing. It doesn't move the structure at all. So they add another 10,000 bricks. They add 15,000 bricks, 20,000 bricks. A significant number of bricks is added before Mark realizes that this isn't going to work um, and he needs to come up with another solution. He does indeed come up with another solution. Um, and you can see here on the top of the tunnel shaft, you've got a steam engine that is pumping the water out of, uh, out of the tunnel shaft. He orders this steam engine to be turned off, um, which allows this structure to, be, to fill up with water, softening the earth, and then allowing the structure to move just that couple, those remaining two feet to allow um, construction on the tunnel itself to begin. The second um, great idea that sort of Mark had when designing uh, the construction of the tunnel was his tunneling shield. Now, this uh, is an image actually from the uh, Thames Tunnel Archive, which we acquired in 2017. And this shows two layers of um, a tunnel, tunneling shield. But in actual fact, the, the one that they ended up using, this is a kind of early design of it. Uh, Mark actually ends up using um, three layers of people. So you've got three levels of individuals. Each individual, as you see, is in their sort of own cell. Um, but actually each um, level, each sort of floor, I suppose, has 12 people in it. So you've got 36 miners um, working at any given time all together um, to dig the tunnel. And this is where we go back to um, the idea of our ship's worm, which creates this protective casing around itself. So you see this tunneling shield has, um, uh, it has this sort of roof up at the top, which helps protect the workers while they're down there um, from the soft earth that they're digging into. Um, you can also see, if I turn the animation on, um, that in front of each of them, it's all done by hand tools. And they've got, um, in front of each of them is a series of wooden slats. Uh, and each slat is removed. The uh, sort of material behind is the earth behind is excavated. The slat is replaced, and then they move on to the next one. And they do this a series of times um, across uh, across the cell in front of each of them. Uh, and then when everyone has excavated in front of them, the whole structure, which is on these sort of uh, jacks, moves forward, and they're able to keep going. Uh, the reason why that's so important, why that's so crucial, is when you're digging under a riverbed, you want to make sure you're digging under the right bit of river. You don't want to go too far up to the um, to the the level to the to the sort of water level because it will flood, uh, and you don't want to go too far down into the hard earth because you won't be able to tunnel through it. So keeping um, keeping on the same plane was really really important uh, for the construction of the tunnel. Um, so the uh, miners would dig um, using the tunneling shield. Um, you'd have also have laborers moving um, uh, material back and forth. Um, and then you'd have the bricklayers who would come in behind and build the brick and, and build the tunnel itself. Um, and that tended to work uh, very well, except um, when it didn't. Uh, and sometimes um, the scariest point in building the tunnel was the bit between the miners excavating the earth and before the bricklayers who had a chance to lay the bricks. And in those moments um, were the moments where floods would happen. Um, and you can, this is a, you can see this example of um, the sort of three level um, tunneling shield. But unfortunately, um, you can also see that water has come in to the, um, into the tunnel itself. So the tunnel did flood on several occasions uh, during its construction. Um, one of the worst um, occurrences happened fairly early on, a couple of years into the construction. And uh, Isambard, King de Brunel, I told you we'd get to him at some point. Uh, he uh, is Mark's son. He's about 18 years of age at this point, And it's his very first engineering project. Uh, and while he is sort of supervising uh, the um, water ingress is reported uh, and uh, the tunnel begins to flood. Uh, Isambard tries to escape uh, through one route. He finds that his, his way is blocked um, on, on the stairs. So he tries to go out another route uh, through some kind of um, 
in the sort of chaos, he ends up hurting himself. He ends up, I think, breaking his leg and has to be rescued uh, by Beamish, um, who was his kind of second in command. So Isambard was very lucky on that occasion to escape with his life. Uh, five of his colleagues on that occasion were not quite so lucky. Uh, they weren't the first people, uh, unfortunately, to die during the construction of the tunnel. And unfortunately, they weren't the last. Um, it was an incredibly dangerous undertaking. However, the danger, um, while it did uh, frighten some of the uh, shareholders uh, a little bit, um, Isambard in his uh, sort of with one eye on the public relations um, and sort of uh, what we might call today stakeholder management, uh, he came up with the idea of the banquet under the Thames, which took place uh, in November 1828, uh, which uh, I think is an incredibly bold way of reassuring people uh, that something is safe that has recently flooded to have a massive great banquet in that very same space. Uh, but it, that's exactly what happened. Um, so you can see uh, they had the very long tables uh, with, with the, the great and the good. They had lovely sort of crystal ware on the tables um, and these sort of linen tablecloths. What you can't see in this painting is there was also a second table uh, set up for a lot of the uh, the workers. They had their own sort of celebration at the same time. Um, and the other thing to uh, alert you to in this picture, uh, this chap, I believe, is meant to be uh, Mark Brunel. Um, this is actually artistic license, uh, and Mark was never at that event. He was uh, recuperating elsewhere. Um, so that was the very first. Uh, the banquet under the Thames took place in 1828. Unfortunately, um, further floods did happen, uh, but flooding wasn't the only um, mishap that might uh, befall a worker working on the Thames Tunnel. Um, so as well as uh, flooding, um, because there's obviously no natural light when you're working underground, the only light source is coming from gas lanterns, uh, which were liable to explode if you uh, encountered a pocket of, of uh, some kind of flammable gas um, as you're excavating. Um, other lovely things that they would excavate uh, while they were um, digging the tunnel were things like acids uh, that could lead to blindness, either temporarily or uh, permanently. Um, so it was an incredibly dangerous undertaking. Um, initially, um, they anticipated that the uh, construction would take three years. Uh, it took 18 in total. Um, but that does include a sort of seven, eight year period where the tunnel itself was closed um, because due to money troubles, um, the, the construction of the tunnel had to be um, had to be paused. Um, again, Isambard with his uh, PR head on um, decided that they should put a big uh, mirror um, up on the sort of wall that they'd bricked up the tunnel with so people could imagine what the completed tunnel uh, would be like. Uh, by 1843, people didn't have to imagine what the tunnel would be like. It was, uh, did I say 1850, 1843, sorry. Uh, the tunnel was opened to the public. It was incredibly popular. Uh, people came from uh, far and wide to, to uh, visit it, to come and see um, what was uh, th this kind of eighth wonder of the world, as it was known, uh, because it was the first tunnel under a navigable river anywhere in the world and it really was um, a remarkable feat um, and just to say this staircase um, that you see here in this image you can still see um, some of the sort of uh, archaeology you can see where that staircase was if you come and visit us um, and see the uh, the tunnel shaft um, unfortunately um, Although Mark had always intended for the tunnel to be a vehicular tunnel to take uh, cargo and horses and carts through, um, because of the money difficulties that had been encountered throughout the construction of the project, uh, the shareholders wouldn't release funds in order to build those um, ramps uh, for the horses. So it only ever um, remained a foot tunnel it only ever sort of opened up as a foot tunnel became a sort of tourist attraction rather than a sort of uh, more functional space as it had been intended um a little bit later um to kind of keep people engaged and interested in in the tunnel itself 
the Thames Tunnel Fancy Fairs were launched in 1852, um, and these were sort of underground uh, carnivals uh, taking place um, with all sorts of uh, all sorts of brilliant Victorian sideshows like uh, Grand Moving Panorama, uh, the Great American Wizard, a Pantomimic Equilibrist, uh, which we think is is some kind of acrobat, uh, and my favourite of all those Victorian sideshows. Electricity, uh, which obviously was was an amazing wonder to behold um, in the 1850s. Um, unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on your perspective, I suppose, uh, some years later, uh, the sort of sheen had gone off the Thames Tunnel. It was no longer um, the sort of prized uh, tourist attraction that people were um, wanted to go and visit. It was. Um, because there was only a penny uh, to visit, a lot of people who didn't have anywhere else to sleep would find themselves in the Thames Tunnel looking for somewhere that was sort of fairly safe, fairly dry, um, which then meant, uh, and the space sort of developed uh, a bit of a reputation. It was known as Hades Hotel, um, and it was somewhere where, which got a reputation for sex workers and, and, and pickpockets and, and thieves. Um, so it sort of stopped um it sort of stopped being this, this incredibly kind of popular space um in 1869 it was sold uh, the Thames Tunnel Company sold the tunnel itself to the London Metropolitan Railway uh, and as Alan alluded to in his intro it's still part of the London underground system uh and it's still in use today uh though slightly ironically it's part of the London overground even though it's underground um, so you can uh, still go through the Thames Tunnel um, if you get on the overground from Wapping to Rotherhithe or the other way. Um, and as, as Alan said, it doesn't take very long. It's about 30 seconds, sort of blink and you'll miss it. Um, but, but you are going through Mark Brunel's tunnel. Um, and my favourite fact about that is the tunnel, the tunnels themselves. I should really say tunnels because there's a sort of north and a south. Um, but the tunnels never had to be widened, apparently. So the, the size that they were um, when they were built in, 18, in the 1820s is, is the size that they are now, which I think is um, incredibly um, uh, sort of serendipitous. Um, so that's our, um, that's a sort of whistle stop tour of the Thames Tunnel. Um, so we tell the story um, in the Brunel Museum. Uh, so our collections are held in that engine house, which I showed you right at the beginning, uh, which dates from 1843. Why is there an engine house? Well, when they opened uh, the tunnel to the public, that steam engine that had been on the top of the tunnel shaft had to be moved somewhere else. Uh, so it was moved next door. They built the engine house around it. And now we store our... Um, our collection in there, which is uh, a series of kind of models relating to how the um, how the tunnel was constructed, but also um, this is one of my favourite display cases, which has all of the sort of Thames Tunnel souvenirs. Um, so it was it you have to think about it as a sort of modern day, uh, a sort of Victorian Disneyland. Uh, so whereas you might buy Mickey Mouse ears and a T-shirt, uh, you'd be buying sort of um, earthenware flasks and plates. Uh, and sort of um, yeah, glassware and cheroot cases and, and things like that. Um, so you can see all of those uh, if you come and visit us. Um, part of your visit includes a tour of the tunnel shaft, um, which you can um, you can go down and visit. You can also hire it for events. Um, and I mentioned before that a lot of the images in this presentation have come from the Thames Tunnel Archive, which is an amazing collection of um, drawings, uh, sort of watercolours, um, images that were uh, created both by Mark, but also Isambard and some of the other kind of um, members of that engineering team. Uh, and they really, they're this incredible record of how the design involved in the Thames Tunnel changed, uh, but they're also kind of beautiful objects in, in their own right. Uh, so the museum acquired them uh, back in 2017, uh, and we are at the moment fundraising for our Brunel Museum Reinvented project, which uh, will allow us to display those archives 
uh, display the archive in uh, sort of uh, better conditions in our engine house, um, which will also include a sort of brand new uh, pavilion building. Um, so we are yeah, fundraising for that at the moment. Um, something that I wanted to share with you, um, this was the, the slide that I was sneaking in. Uh, one of my first and really fun jobs when I started, because uh, we were all still locked down and we wanted to find a way of engaging, uh, engaging people with the history of the Thames Tunnel um, in, a, in, a, in a really fun way that they could kind of do at home. We worked with an amazing group called a company called Deadlocked, who do both online and in-person escape rooms. Uh, so we have Tunneling Through Time, uh, our online escape room adventure. And I'm very proud to say that we are finalists for the Business Pivot Award for the Southwark Business Awards. Um, I've checked, you don't have to be a resident of Southwark um, to vote. So uh, I, if, if you've got two seconds, it literally only takes two seconds once you click on the link to vote for us for that award we would really, really appreciate it. Um, we couldn't do what we do um, in any way without our amazing volunteers. We have uh, an incredible group of really dedicated individuals uh, who, who help us um, do all of the things uh, that we do. So we, um, yeah, I just really want to say thanks to all of our volunteers, but if um, any of you are interested, if you've got a spare uh, couple of hours uh, during the week, or at weekends, uh, please do let me know because um, we're always looking for enthusiastic volunteers. As I mentioned, you can also hire the space. Uh, we have uh, we've, we've done a series of weddings this year. Uh, we've also done book launches. We've done uh, private parties. Um, uh, we had an interview uh, with Terry Gilliam uh, the other day, which uh, someone hired us for. Um, so yeah, really kind of... Uh, making the most of our spaces we've got an online shop check it out uh, and that's my sort of the end of my plug uh, i can see that there i think there's been some stuff in the chat already um but, yeah shall yeah. i read those out catherine that was great thank you um yeah there's somebody was asking about the model and saying is it that the model of the tamar bridge and sarah says Oh, this was a separate. So I was asking a different question about Queen Victoria visiting, but it was it the Tamar Bridge? It looked like it was. Which, that, oh, that, this the one. one right at the bottom there. Yes, I think that probably is, isn't it? I'm I'm not so hot on on the bridges. You've just been um, to Cornwall, you said earlier, or told me. Yes, earlier. that's true. Yes, I did, but it looks very different when you're on a train going. Yeah, through. exactly. <laughs> yeah, it looks very um, like the Tamar Bridge. Um, and we've got um, we've got two uh, outside, um, which I don't think you can see in any of the pictures that I've got here. Uh, we've got a couple of um, public benches, uh, which are also in the design of, of uh, some of Brunel the Younger's bridges. Oh, right. Why? Um, 18 years, I would think, you know, a delay in, in opening the tunnel is not much. Really, I mean, you just have to look at what's happened to Berlin Brandenburg Airport in the last couple of decades, and they've probably beaten all records for major major projects that went wrong. Um, and, and of course, there are lots of others around the world. I have cross Crossrail. <laughs> I'm sorry, sorry, transport people, uh, especially transport people in my family. Um, crossrail. Um, but one of the really interesting things I, I find is if you can scroll back to one of the pictures, that picture of the dinner. Uh, oh, yeah. Why is it shown completely out of that one? Why is it so completely out of perspective? I mean, I've walked through that tunnel again on open days when they were converting it, certainly before the uh, London Overground took over, and then way back about... 15 years ago, when there was some more work, they were waterproofing it, not very effectively. Um, and it's not as wide as that. You said it didn't have to be widened. That's what, that looks like it's uh, five metres wide. And really it's about, it's barely, it's just enough, fortunately, to get a full-size train in. So it's no more than about three metres wide, I would have thought. Um, was it just artistic license, I guess, to make it look really huge? 
Yes, probably. Um, yes. I, I don't, I, I would, I don't know that for for certain. Um, I've, I've also, uh, I don't actually, I haven't measured the tunnel. No. How, how wide it is. But I think the other thing that I should probably point out is that what I've done in this for this slide is I've actually zoomed. I, I've made it, it larger for the yeah. for the. So the the actual yeah. painting itself is um, it goes up. A bit yes. more, but I but there's not much happening at the top of the painting. No, but I think I think me. I think they just used to exaggerate the size of it. Um, well, there there is a lot of artistic license going on in this particular picture. Yeah, take so. Yeah. Um, so <laughs> the the two gentlemen at the front. Yeah. Are uh, Mark Brunel and Isambard Kingdom Brunel? Oh, that's Isambard, is it? Right. But that is meant to be Isambard. Mark wasn't there. Mm. But the uh, painter thought he should have been, so he painted him in anyway. Right. Well, I'm okay. once you're taking that level of liberty. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Fine. Yes. Right. Anybody else got any questions? Uh, oh, Mary says, "Do you have any liaison with the Great Eastern Launch Site? And will we ever get the sign back on the River Wall?" Uh... Uh, well, this the second one. Um... I haven't. I don't. I don't know. I don't know what sign on the river wall. Um, Mary, do you to... mean the signs on the Great Eastern side or on the south side? You're muted, Mary. The the I read the, the earlier question, which is about the Great Eastern, is a bit further up actually. But there used to be on the wall opposite where the Great Launch Site is um, painted. This is the launch site of Great Eastern. Mm. It was taken off when the wall was rebuilt and never replaced. But I think the launch site has recently had some sort of a recognition of English heritage. I think I've seen an article in the last week or so about that. And then, um, you know, obviously it is something which is quite close to what you're doing. Well, I was walking past it last year when I was doing my preparation for the talk I did in October last year. And there was a one of those big display boards, but it didn't. It was very weather beaten, so you couldn't really read it very well. Um, so I think but it needs it needs renewal certainly. I was basically asking further up, and there's another couple of things coming as well as me on the chat yeah. but about the Great Eastern and the. Um, there was a book which the project published, I think, about three years ago, and I was only remarking the Great Eastern, of course, great interest in Greenwich because it's worked as a cable ship from end of is. And just saying, you know, that the book's still around and hopefully available. Yeah. Cool. So I was, I, uh, one of the things that Alan and I were talking about just at the, the beginning, um, b before other people joined us, is that we do, um, sort of since I've, I've joined, I've been very much kind of focusing on uh, getting to know the, the Thames Tunnel, Story and the kind of history of that and, and really sort of focusing on that that story but we do um again sort of to reiterate not a Brunel scholar um but we do have um a, a really lovely a really fascinating kind of collection of SS Great East, Eastern photographs and you're absolutely right that we are sort of um geographically very close to the SS Great Eastern launch site so we do uh, we have in the past kind of referred to ourselves as the, to, we, that we tell the story of, of Isambard's first and last projects, uh, which I think is really interesting that they, mm. they ended up being quite different projects, but, but so geographically close. Um, yeah. In terms of who, who, is, uh, who is responsible for the, the SS Great Eastern site, that I don't know, but I will. But it's interesting you're saying that um, English heritage, it, it might belong to English heritage. So I'll, I'll look that up after this talk. Uh, Dan Hayton. Dan, do you want to join us? Because you uh, come on online because you say that there was uh, Glias and Goldsmiths even class, of which I and my wife Joan were members of oh, 40 years ago, mm -hmm. carried out a photo survey and measured drawings of the engine house. Uh, when the engine house was recognised in the middle of a scrapyard, and I remember that about that part of East London. Dan, join us. Yeah, I was just um, going to say that there, uh, if I remember rightly, the tunnel was dug as one big hole and then the centrepiece was put in afterwards. Ah. But that might, that might 
that might be a misremembrance. One of the important things uh, about the um, tunnel refurbishment was that when the three wise men were chosen uh, to advise on the tunnel refurbishment, two of them were Glias members. Um, Good. And the London transport engineers were holding their hands up in horror and saying, the tunnel leaks, the tunnel leaks, we'll have to seal it, we'll have to seal it. And of course, since one of the wise men was Dennis Smith, uh, an engineering historian. Who used to asked, run the Goldsmiths Evening class. Used to run the Goldsmiths class. Yeah. Um, and uh, he asked, by how much is it leaking? And they said, we don't know, but it's leaking, it's leaking. And he said, but by how much? And they said, well, we don't know. And he said, but we know how much it was leaking by when it was being built and when it was finished because it's in Brunel's notes. <laughs> so um, that was a bit of a bit of an unfortunate thing. I have and it is still it. leaking, because when I walked yes, down it yes. five years ago, one of it was, yeah. uh, you could hear it gurgling away. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's controlled and pumped out, and it's, yeah. to a certain extent, part of it is um, a release of the hydrostatic pressure of the water above. Yeah. Um, it's a controlled leak. But I, I have, uh, with my wife, um, actually had dinner in the Thames Tunnel. Oh, right. But it was uh, part of a celebration for 125th anniversary or something. And uh, we used the preserved electric locomotive, Sarah Siddons, and had a train that ran from Howe on the Hill down around the metropolitan lines uh, and back and forth through the different bores of the tunnel while we all ate uh, a pre lease prepared dinner. Uh, which was being cooked in, in the baggage, in the baggage part of the, of the carriage. Um, sure. But it, we got some very funny looks as we pulled through the stations because uh, there was a, a real train with people in evening dress sitting at the tables having dinner as we went through places like Moorgate and so yeah, on. I can um, quite understand that. Yeah, <laughs> caused some consternation. Uh, my son at TfL um, and the museum, the transport museum, has uh, uh, been on some celebratory trains when it's just gone through platforms, and people on the platforms have wondered why this train has not stopped. Um, you, the the recordings that Clias and Goldsmiths made, the, the the drawings, are they still around? And and you know, is it something that they could be copied and go to go to the museum? Yes, we ought, we actually ought to have a look because there are a series of photographs, uh, both black and white prints and slides that were taken. But we'd have to be able to find them <laughs> in, the, in the chaos that is life at these this remove. Yes, I'll, I'll try and remember um, to go and have a look. But the some... drawings were done by Ken Catford. Okay. Um, who later went on to be county architect in Cheshire. And I think he may still have them up on the Wirral. Right. I shall sure drop him an email and ask. That would be great. Um, Max in the box, whoever that may be, says, is the museum permitted to install disabled or lift access to the base of the shaft? Catherine. Um, so we would really like to. Um, but at the moment, we don't have the funds for it. I think I don't know about the permissions that we need, but I think we probably could. I don't want to speak for Historic England, uh, but I, I think there is some uh, capacity for that. Uh, when Prior to my time in 2016, um, we installed a, a, the, the stairs, I'll just see if I can get the picture of the stairs yeah. up again. Um, so we do we do have uh, the stairs, which I know are no good uh, if um, you that require one. Yeah. a wheelchair. Um, but what this, what I'm not sure you can necessarily see in this picture um, is that we do have a viewing platform uh, up here. Uh, and as part of the Brunel Museum Reinvented project, um, we want to completely sort of change the um, 
at the moment the engine house has something uh something like nine different levels um which make, means that it's not um it, it is accessible but it's not necessarily particularly sort of welcoming mm. uh so we that's a that's a it's really important that we, we put in a sort of purpose-built lift in the engine house so that's our kind of first priority for now uh, but the intention is definitely to put a lift into the tunnel shaft at some point um, when we can sort of raise enough funds and, and do all of that. But for the time being, um, we've got the viewing platform and we're sort of looking at using more digital technology to give you that kind of way of uh, seeing a bit more of the tunnel shaft. Excellent. Uh, Elizabeth Piercy, uh, who's one of our committee members, said, can you say a bit more about the day-to-day -day finances Enabling the running of the museum, and Elizabeth has a professional interest in this sort of thing. Elizabeth, do you want to unmute yourself and actually say it in person? Uh, you've said it for me, Alan. I'm, I think it's a very <laughs> interesting, the Brunel Museum is a very interesting example of how you can run a business on an industrial site. And I wondered if Catherine would like to say a bit more about that. And of course, the challenges of lockdown. <laughs> Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, so if, if you want to kind of, you know, have a more in-depth discussion, I'm, I'm really happy to kind of take that offline. Um, but yeah, we, um, I suppose the first, first thing I would say is that the, uh, the museum is first and foremost a museum and a registered charity. Um, but we obviously, like everyone, have had to become a bit more entrepreneurial in our approach. Um, especially sort of since COVID. Um, so we have, um, uh, I've mentioned sort of tunneling through time, our online escape room, That's that's been a big um, part of our income generating strategy. Uh, the online shop um, has been really, really important, particularly during lockdown, so sort of finding ways of uh, engaging with people when they cannot physically come to your site. Uh, so, so that's been the online shop, our tunneling through time, uh, activity has been really important for that. Now that we are open again, we opened again in May, um, we've been able to sort of, you know, uh, open up again so we can have, uh, you know, admissions um, and we've changed, slightly changed the sort of um, the visit so everyone is, is sort of guaranteed a tour of the tunnel shaft um, as part of their visit. Um, we obviously, uh, yeah, have our shop, we've got venue hire. So, uh, yeah, we've been sort of looking at lots of different ways to kind of generate income uh which hopefully means that if we have a sort of um uh if if something goes wrong with one thing it doesn't mean sort of the end of the museum it's very much about sort of uh our kind of financial sustainability and resilience in the future uh which you know when we're definitely not sort of you know over covid in in lots of different ways uh but we're um yeah, we're in a much better position than, than we were when I took on the, the role in January. Right. Um, Jackie Robinson says, who are the miners? Were they London labourers or were they imported from out of town? Do you know? So this is my favourite subject. Um, <laughs> and I don't, I, I, I really want to know more. I've been, I've been trying to do, to, um, to do a bit of sort of research um, on mm. the site. So we, um, we think that uh, a lot of the sort of miners were from Somerset and Cornwall, where they were sort of used to, to, to mining. Um, so while it was sort of, they were mining, but, but doing very kind of different work. We also have done some research looking at the, um, the sort of the navvies who built the canals. And Alan, I know you're, you're gonna talk about canals mm. um, in, a couple, in a couple of months. Um, but we've identified at least um, at least one individual uh, called uh, Seamus Fitzpatrick, who was uh, Irish and um, was involved in the digging of the Thames Tunnel. And we've now, uh, one of the projects that we did, in fact, for St. Patrick's Day, was we've created a new character actor as part of our school's programme, but we created a series of films about Seamus's life and his experiences um, his experiences sort of uh, digging the tunnel. So we released them for St. Patrick's Day this year while we were all still in lockdown. Um, but hopefully we'll be able to actually have, um, you know, a proper St. Paddy's Day knees up uh, in March oh, 2022. Good. 
I suppose there's probably no employment records left, Arthur, um, unless you've got death certificates for people who died in the, when, when it flooded. Unfortunately, the people that we know the most about are the ones who died yeah. uh, during, yeah. during the construction, I should say. Um, it, yeah. Construction in 1825, it's a safe bet they're probably all dead now. Um, <laughs> yes. But, yeah. um, but yes, the ones that died during construction, we have information about them. Um, and it's, we hosted a... Uh, a, a walking tour of the sort of local area because um, St Mary's Church is very nearby, the cemetery there, um, a lot of the, uh, some of the, the men who died during the construction were buried there oh, okay. um, and we did a sort of walking tour looking at the lives that were of, of, of the people who worked on the tunnel because it's really and that's again to talk about the sort of future plans telling those stories of the people who actually built the tunnel is as important as the sort of engineering um, ingenuity um, of Mark Brunel. Yeah. Um, Bill Burns, thank you. Bill has sent a link on in the chat for Historic England photograph of the Great in, uh, Eastern Launch Site signs. Um, Roger Mead says he understands that some of the girders in Rotherhouse Station were designed by Brunel. Is that correct? Does anybody know? I guess somebody probably knows a bit about the history of Rotherhouse Station, but I don't know. I don't. <laughs> I, I don't know, but I will. I, I'm interested now. <laughs> yes. Um, somebody called Jill says her great 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 grandfather was a messenger in the tunnel um and jackie robinson also says uh her i assume her ancestor was also uh, lived locally was a messenger in the tunnel in the 1840s what were the messengers Do you know, Catherine, what the messengers were? What they? No, were? I don't. Sorry, I didn't realise that was. I I thought you were asking Jill and Jackie because I don't no. know. I'm, well, I'm, if, I'm if really Jill or Jackie now. could join in and say what what messengers did, if they know, I mean, it was 180 years ago, so it, a long time. So I don't know whether family history actually says what what messengers did. Either of you know? Um, you mute yourself. This is Jill. No, I don't yes. know. And I'd be really keen to find out. Jackie and I are sisters. Oh, I see. Okay. <laughs> right. that makes so it's the same ancestor. Okay, fine. Yeah. Um, I don't, yeah, interesting. Um, I guess any I, in the days before telephones and uh, radio walkie talkies and things like that, you had to have people carrying bits of paper around for messaging people on any site. So maybe they did that. Um, Can you find that out? Is it is it is there sort of census in census yes information and that's the is that the job that's listed or how did you find that out just so um, I I know where to focus my research. Uh, I was on a birth certificate. It was listed as being a messenger um, yes. on the birth certificate. Oh, and and but it says Thames Tunnel or did yeah, it just yeah messenger in the Thames Tunnel yeah. Wow. Was there not some suggestion also, Jill, that he'd been a servant with Brunel, or that was your? No, he'd been a, he'd been a servant. I fancied that it might have been with Brunel, but I don't think so. I have no idea. Right. But he certainly was a, a, a gentleman's servant before he was a messenger. I think there's a lot of fascinating family history we could dig out if we had time about the local, the people who live in this area. Whose you know whose families have been around for nearly two hundred years, yeah. and probably worked in the telegraph factory at Enderby, uh, worked in the all the sites along Deptford Creek and and in the Thames Tunnel and the shipping industry, of course. Yeah. Um, hold on now. My wife says, hello, Joan, says, are there any pictures of the workers' dinner under the tunnel and where did they live? So I think, as far as I'm aware, the only image that, that we hold at the, at the museum is, is that banquet painting. Um, right. We do have some descriptions um, of, uh, of, of, the, um, of the dinner itself, and, and they include things like the... Um, uh, I think it was written up in the Times actually, and Sarah will probably know more about this than me. But it, it, they had, they did all sorts of toasts and 
they sang loads of songs and 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 the work has actually presented um Brunel with his own Isambard with his own kind of set of tools um as a sort of token of appreciation um it sounds like an absolutely raucous evening um, (laughs) by all accounts it sounds absolutely brilliant And, and I know that that definitely lots of people kind of associated with the museum um, including some of our trustees are quite keen that we sort of recreate it. Somehow. Oh, what a wonderful idea! Um, <laughs> which, which, which I'm definitely, I'm, you know, I'm keen to do um, at some point. But yeah, that's um, uh, that's. I think that that's what the images that we sort of have. Um, yeah. So, so unfortunately, obviously, the workers weren't deemed important enough to get their own portrait. So. No. It sounds like a proper Victorian Beano. Um, Jill again says she read that Queen Victoria's visit was at such short notice they had to send a messenger out to find flowers to decorate the site. In desperation, he was grabbing geraniums off the window sills of the Rotherhithe residence. Hmm. Um, I can't imagine the Rotherhithe residents being very pleased with that. <laughs> but um, my my favourite story of the Victor- the Queen Victoria visit, um, which I think is 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 in really, really, really great story, um, is uh, sort of there was apparently a puddle or something and there was a nearby vendor who was selling kind of silk kerchief type things. Um, and he, he threw his entire, um, his entire sort of stock on the, on the puddle so that Queen Victoria could progress without sort of getting her feet wet or, you know, getting her shoes oh, wet. Oh, really? And That's it's this sort of idea of, oh, isn't that, oh, how chivalrous of him, how wonderful. He, I mean, he gave up his entire stock just to, um, just for the Queen. But actually he was incredibly, uh, he was incredibly enterprising because he was then selling them as Queen Victoria stepped on my kerchiefs, Queen Victoria stepped on <laughs> yeah. the kerchiefs. So I just think that's, that's an absolutely brilliant sort of, um, a, 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 yeah, he's a really savvy mind, whoever did that. And it's very redolent of Queen Elizabeth I, 350 years before, or 300 years before, stepping in a puddle at Deptford, just down the river, you know, and it was, who was it, Walter Raleigh or Francis Drake? I can't remember. It was a long time ago I learned that at school. (laughs) Um, Now, David and or Louisa White says, did the circular brick structure since completely vertical or go at an angle so is this is the circular brick structure vertical or is it slightly twisted i don't know that i understand the question actually uh, the, the the shaft that you see there in the middle yeah. there is that vertical or is it is it gone slightly sloping in, over the years oh the um the the shaft, the tunnel shaft is, yeah has it gone uh I wouldn't know. It seems right. it seems fine when I go and step into it. Yeah. Um, but I, I I don't. I suppose is the question: Is it still sinking? Yeah. Is that is that sort of at the heart of the question? Yeah. I don't know. I don't know. Um, possibly not mm-hmm. so much that we are worried about it from a structural point of view. Mm. But to be honest. Ev- Everything in in London is always moving a little bit, isn't it? So yes, um, yeah, it, it it may well yes. I think if you if you came along and brought sort of um, spirit level um, yeah. to the uh, to the to the Thames Tunnel floor, I don't know. You might get different readings on different different mm. years. You're getting a lot of lot more a lot of questions still coming in. So if you're you're happy, Catherine, someone says, can, do you have any firm figures as the loss of life by miners, and were the bereaved supported? That is a brilliant question. Um, to hand, I don't have a, a list of them. Yeah. Um, but it was it it was significant. So we know that there were five just in that um in that first uh in in that the floods that i mentioned earlier there were several kind of that, that came later uh the very first person um which is a sort of almost kind of tragic comic story um mm. was when they were first working on the the tunnel shaft essentially it's a great big hole um in the ground and they just sort of tripped and fell into the hole um, so that was the sort of first um the first loss of life as part of the mm. um construction um, in terms of the families being supported, 
Um, I don't think that they were, at least the, the bits of research that we've been able to do so far haven't suggested a huge amount of, of sort of support. Mm. Um, we've done, um, yeah, I might, I'll, I'll see what I can dig out actually, because there's some, there's, there is some really interesting things about how, because the only people we tend to really know about are the ones who died we know have some information about the inquest and sort of you know their families and, and things like that and, and things that happen but there are some fairly sort of um you know sort of mark's diary there are some fairly sort of you know that feel quite callous sort of you know oh that person died mm. um and it's it it doesn't you know it, it it doesn't feel like that's a sort of big moment um mm. so yeah it's a sort of um it, yeah, there, there's a lot more interesting stuff to be kind of uncovered about that. In fact, if yeah. I stop sharing, I may, I've, I've got a document on my desktop, so if we stop sharing for a second, I can see what else I can dig out about yeah. that. While Catherine is having a quick look, yeah. um, I could mention something about the workers for the Thames Archway Company, yes. which was an attempt to drive a tunnel from the top of Surrey Docks across the river, but it was done uh, led by Richard Trevithick, Ooh, um, right. who imported Cornish miners, who of course were sorry to use the phrase, completely out of their depth <laughs> because they were mining in, in soft soil, not hard rock. Quite. Um, the comment was made that the bellows weren't much use in ventilating the adit because they hardly had the strength to blow out a candle at the working face. Mm. Um, so that, that was that. But that, that particular uh, scheme got as far as they reckon as low water mark on the north side. Starting from the south side. Starting from the south side. Yeah. Uh, but it was it was as a very small edit, uh, which yeah. would then be open, theoretically would be opened up into a full size tunnel, which is the way you would do it in hard rock. But of course it didn't work in soft gravel that you find in the Thames. Yeah. Hmm. Uh, my phrasing is usually that it is the first successful tunnel dug under dug through soft ground under a major river <laughs> because that. that takes into account yeah. um, even some uh, tunnels that might be mythical. The, um, the, the great the, thing is that it's always the first if you put out enough adjectives on it. Um, indeed. <laughs> but but there was, it's, it's there still was, pretty impressive, I think, yes, that the, uh, the tunnel much. under the Euphrates, if that existed, uh, was cut and cover. They, uh, the accounts we have say they diverted the river and then dug the tunnel. So that's why I get to discount that one. What date was that, so? Um, Many BC. Oh, right. OK. Yeah. <laughs> there was yeah. a tunnel in Newcastle which started after uh, the Thames Tunnel and finished beforehand. But it was cheating because it was dug in through the rock strata. Right. Um, and of course it had a lot of backing because it had a particular use in transporting coal. And so it yeah. had lots of coal miners around to do it. Yeah, and, and also you had a lot of, um, you know, a lot of people who had a, a positive interest in it. Whereas the Thames Tunnel was a bit speculative, really. You know, we needed a crossing, but who's going to use it? Mm. Um, Mary says, Mary Mill says, current edition of since Subterranea has an article about an underwater foot tunnel from Penalth. Uh, Sarah's put uh, details of the contemporary new newspaper article about the banquet in the chat. Uh, Roland says, could Catherine please mention the website again? Is this uh, brunelmuseum.com or is there something else for the virtual virtual walkabout? Catherine. Yeah, so I will, um, 
I can just add the well the main museum website um yeah. I can also share the tunneling through time website uh and we also did um before I started during the first lockdown uh, the museum created some virtual um virtual tours from different right. periods of time so I will add those in yeah. um um, so thanks. the virtual tours are not currently active because we're in the midst of changing platform for them. Right. OK. So be patient. Thank you. <laughs> thanks, Sarah. Um, we do the escape room and said all come and visit us in person. Yes, exactly. As we shall. Um, and Sarah, you thank you for that note about deaths from 7 to 11, direct deaths plus many illnesses. Uh, and Mary points out that the Black Wall and the Greenwich Foot Tunnel had medical teams on site. And this was thought to be revolutionary. Yeah. There's all sorts of reports which they did about the workers and the mm. deaths were monitored and followed up. But of course, this is 1890 since the London County Council. Yeah. Very different sort of scheme. Um, mm. I, and I was going to say, you know, that I think the Foot Tunnel and the Black Wall are very relevant to the Thames Tunnel, although they're so much later. And to sort of advertise that although the Friends of the Foot Tunnel has um, put itself out of business, that myself and Ian, Ian's on here somewhere, um, have sought quite a bit to say about it. Yeah. Can I also add, and I promise I'll shut up and go, but the last time I was at the Thames Tunnel was to see the uh, Great Eastern book launched by Prince Edward. And there were more, so, more secret service men there than there were audience. It was incredible. <laughs> right um and anything else i think we're sort of running out of questions uh anybody want to add some last questions we're now 8 36 37 um uh, thank you very much catherine and sarah for your contributions um and for all your questions everybody um any more final questions before we say goodbye and uh, I'll just point out that right at the top of the chat, Mary's put a list of the forthcoming meetings, and I'll go through those again. Uh, you'll see them on, if you look at the Greenwich Industrial History um, group on Facebook, which you can join, and I think we've got about a thousand people on there at the moment. Um, oh, much more, it's more. Yeah. Since then. <laughs> um, 12th of October, we've got Nina Baker on Caroline Haslett. We're normally on the second Tuesday of every month. 9th of November, Stuart Ash on the uh, the Pluto cable, the, the pipeline under the ocean used in World War II. Um, and 14th of December, I'm going to be talking about South London's failed canals, and uh, as I said earlier. so And I'm busy researching that at the moment. I've got next week off, and I'm going to go and take some pictures and do lots of stuff. Um, Alan, it's uh, Roland here. I was asking about the uh, the website. See, Catherine's put that on the, on the notes yeah. there. Is it possible to put that on the website of the uh, or our website? Yeah, the industrial. But, website. I mean, you can Google Brunel Museum reference. and you find yeah, it. Yeah, it might really... be useful though. And thank you, Catherine. Okay. Yeah, um, I'll, thank I'll put it in the you. comments on the. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Cheers. Thank you. Any final? Thank you, uh, Catherine. Uh, any final comments before we close? And this has been really good. Thank you very much. So I would just jump in and, and, and say sort of finally um, that, that it's been it's been really lovely just kind of I've got as, as much out of this as I, I really hope that you guys have got something from it. And I, I hope to see some of you at least in person um, at the museum. Um, and, and yeah, I am, you know, I, I think I said at the beginning, you know, we were a really, really small, small team. We couldn't do what we mm. do without our volunteers. Um, but that, you know. It, it means that while we would love to do loads of research, we, we do kind of rely on your knowledge and enthusiasm. So if you do come across stuff about the Thames Tunnel that we might not have come across ourselves, please do, you know, drop us a line and we'll, you know, um, especially as we're sort of trying to develop our new exhibition yep. and tell a bit more of the workers stories. So I've, I've sent Jackie and I'm going to send Jill a message about, um, uh, about their ancestor, the messenger, because I'm really interested in this now. Good, good. Well, as you know, we've got such a wonderful 
eclectic bunch of people around here, all interested in Southeast London um, and our industrial history. So I'm sure you, yeah, a lot of more comments. And I will put your link in the uh, on the Facebook group. So if you want to get in touch, um, everybody, there'll be more. And at some point, when I've had time to edit it, I will put this up on our YouTube channel. And if you go onto YouTube, Greenwich Industrial History, search for, and you'll find, I think, six we've got there already. And then the last three of the last season we've got to put up there. Oh, I've still got to put up there. And then we'll carry on and do them as they happen through this uh, autumn and into the spring. And with Mary is busy trying to recruit speakers for the beginning of next year. Oh, you're waving something at me and I can't read it because you're in very small. Mary. Right What's that? You say, do you want to say? Book. Oh, yes. Mary's book on the Greenwich Riverside. Yep. Can you pick it up again so we can see it in big? There. OK, Greenwich Riverside, Mary Mills. It's available only through Amazon. So if anybody <laughs> got doubts about Amazon, then just swallow your reservations. It's a really good book yeah, about everything along Amazon. the Greenwich Riverside. <clears throat> so thank you very much. And with that, I will close. I'll say thank you again to Catherine. Thanks for an excellent presentation. We've really enjoyed it. And uh, keep in touch. We'll keep in touch with you. Thank you very much. Please do. I'll see you all soon. Take care. Thank you very much indeed. And good night, everybody. Good Thank night. you, Alan. Bye. 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 Bye.